Okay, let's start with the quick takeaways for those that don't wanna watch a whole video. The 35 to 150, I understand now the hype behind this lens and why I was on a wait list almost the entirety of last year trying to get my hands on a copy. It's incredibly practical. <laughs> It is so useful to be able to have one lens on your camera, capture your wide shots, and then immediately crash into that extended range of the lens and get those shots that really do simulate the 70 to 200 millimeter feel. This is why I wax poetic about the 24 to 105 range because it's my do everything documentary lens. You can get your wides, get your tights. And let me say the extended range of 150 millimeters over the 105 is noticeable. It's incredibly helpful. So the big question on my mind throughout testing this lens is, is that trade-off on the wide end, the slight less width from 24 millimeters, which I'm used to, down to 35 millimeters, is losing that width worth all the benefits that I get on the extended range? But of course it can't be simplified that much to just the ability to zoom more in, because on the wide end, this lens can open up all the way to F2, which can definitely create some of that background blur that the bokeh-hungry filmmakers among us are really gonna appreciate. There is, however, a couple other caveats that I'm gonna to have to unpack in a little bit more detail, especially around the form factor and handheld filming, some considerations that I had just wished that I knew ahead of time. My quick takeaway on wide angles before we unpack all this, the 17 to 28 and the 20 to 40, which one would I pick? The 20 to 40. This is the ultimate creator adventure lens in my opinion, and I really, really like this lens. This fits really nicely into the way that I shoot solo shot adventure videos. And it's one of the highest compliments that I ever get when people go under the solo videos and go, yeah, he's not alone out there. He's got a crew following him filming. That is like the highest compliment I can receive on that because it is a lot of work to set up all these tripod shots, walk past the camera and then do it again and get all these different angles. I think this range of 20 to 40 millimeters should continue to be a lot more popular than it is yet. I think it's just sort of catching on where people are realizing how powerful it is, how many boxes you can check with a lens like this. I'm building out a lens guide. So if you wanna see kind of uh, extended discussion of some of the trade-offs that I'm talking about here between the different lenses and what they're useful for, that's a resource that I'm creating that you can find in the description below. So welcome back to my series where I explore and test out some of the best lenses for adventure filmmaking. The focus of the series is less on pixel peeping and corner sharpness, but rather how to weigh the pros and cons of each lens to build out a kit that actually allows me to film projects in the way that I want to, which in my world often means carrying all my own gear in a backpack, including my camping gear and food for multiple days, either filming for a documentary in the mountains or on one of my solo adventure videos. Today, we're gonna to be looking at some of the newer offerings from Tamron and reflecting on how this fits through my filter of choosing lenses for the videos I shoot. All the footage you're gonna be seeing today is recorded on my Sony a7S III or my a7IV. Some technical stuff to keep in mind as you watch this is that all the shots are gonna be color graded in my classic style from S-Log3. I'm also gonna be showing when I switch between internal standard stabilization and active stabilization because that changes the range of the lens and also be showing when I go into super 35 mode. For 90% of the shots you're gonna be seeing throughout this video, I used my Polar Pro and D filters. Some of the shots that you're seeing outdoors, I also used the mist version. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to assess what the lens actually looks like. The Polar Pro filters are my current favorites when it comes to ND filters. And I also really like their smaller size matte boxes when I'm filming dock work or client work and I need a more capable system. If you're curious and you wanna see what some of these specific shots look like straight out of camera without color grading, just raw from the camera, let me know which timestamps in the comments and I will do my best to make them available to you in a timely manner. Of course, the best case scenario with any of this is to actually buy the lenses or rent them and actually get them in your hands and go film with them. That's the most telling scenario. You can watch and read spec sheets but actually using the lens is an entirely different story most of the time. And so the last video that I made on lenses had a lot of discussion in the comments and I had two big takeaways or complaints that I was trying to figure out in the way that I had built that kit. So I'm trying to expand on that discussion. So the start of me making this video was actually all kicked off by me purchasing the 17 to 28. I was trying to find a better wide angle zoom and in that process, I was using this lens a bunch. They released the 20 to 40 millimeter. And so of course I had to, I had to try that lens too because it's a more ideal focal range for the way that I film. And then in the meantime, people were constantly asking me, Levi, what do you think of the 35 to 150? And because this lens was so popular out of the gate, I was on a wait list for essentially the entirety of last year. 
trying to get my hands on it. And so while I was trying to formulate my thoughts on these lenses, I actually got an email from Tamron asking if there's any lenses I would like to try. Uh, and that's pretty convenient because yes, I would very much like to try this lens. So Tamron is to sponsor this video by also setting up some lenses to try. And that's very important for me to address because this is not a review. Uh, I don't do paid reviews on my channel, but I will gladly do first look at new equipment so I can get my hands on it and actually try it. That's just selfishly, I like trying new things. So definitely supplement your research with different sources of information. So that way, hopefully for yourself, you can arrive at a good conclusion of where to spend your hard earned money on. I feel like I've got skin in the game investing in these two lenses here and trying to decide what's going to work best for when I physically carry all my gear up mountains, because that's where the cost hits me the most is having to carry all this stuff around. So that's some of the setup that I think you need to know. Let's start talking about these lenses in a little bit more detail. Okay, the 35 to 150. I think I covered most of the reasons why I like this lens in my intro. So let's talk about some rapid fire pros and cons. Pros, build quality, definitely a step up from that more plastic feel that some of Tamron's lenses have had in the past. The weather ceiling is better. I've abused this a bunch filming in Hawaii, just taking on hikes. Like I have not, I'm not gentle on gear and it's been holding up really well to that. I often used tap to focus on the Sony cameras in the different tracking modes. And I found in all my normal use cases, the lens just kept up and tracked the subject matter easily. The lens is definitely hefty. Uh, it comes in at 1,165 grams, and it feels very similar in weight and size to the Sony 70 to 200 millimeter, which comes in just under at 1,045 grams. Before we get to the negatives and unpacking where this lens would fit in my current lens headspace, let's talk about some depth of field. So undoubtedly, one of the big strengths of this lens is that it can open up all the way to F2 on the wide end. That's over two stops of additional light over my trusty F4 24 to 105. And this allows for a lot more shallow depth of field, which is especially noticeable when you're filming at the wider end of the lens. So I'm going to be showing some examples here back and forth with my 24 to 105. And while that's not a fair comparison back and forth, that is the lens that it would be swapping out in my kit. So visually, I just want to show you what the different amounts of bokeh you're going to see as you go through the different aperture ranges of this lens, because it goes from F2. And as you zoom into 150, it slowly stops down to F2.8. One thing that's very exciting for me with the Tamron is that it essentially performs like a par focal lens. This means that if you are in manual focus and you zoom in the lens, the focus plane is gonna stay nearly in the same spot on the subject matter. This is really helpful for those that are filming in manual focus to just kind of track where your subject is. But also if you're doing any of those crash zooms, it just means that the autofocus in the camera has to do way less work. And I personally like reframing shots as I'm in interviews, especially when filming solo, just changing up the perspectives. So having the par focal capabilities in a lens like this is definitely a big plus. Okay, let's talk about some of the downsides. For me, uh, the weight, it's, it's got some heft to it. It's a little bit more hefty than I expected, even from just looking at the photo. So I recommend getting it in your hands because the challenge I ran into is, can I keep this on my camera body all day as I'm doing hiking style filming? So when I'm putting my camera on my shoulder strap and pulling it off quickly, it's, it's, it's threading that really fine line where it definitely makes the whole weight of your camera system a little bit more. So there's certain environments where running with that all day as you're climbing mountains becomes a little bit much. And the biggest negative for me, or at least the biggest thing to work around is definitely the lack of optical stabilization. If this lens was optically stabilized, I don't, I don't even know if that's possible with this focal range. So I'm not going to pretend like that's something that should be done. Uh, but I shoot a lot of handheld and back in the days of filming on the GH5, that definitely spoiled me when the smaller sensor and the lens combination working together just creates incredible handheld opportunities. And that's definitely the style of filming that I like doing. So in my experience, what I learned from a stabilization perspective is if I tried to do any moving handheld shots, like walking forward or tracking beside a subject matter in the standard stabilization mode, the internal stabilization of the sensor had a really hard time keeping up even at the widest end. Often this would result just in that full frame stutter effect that I personally try my best to avoid. Now, if I switched over into active stabilization, it crops in a bit, but I definitely get a much improved performance. More on that trade off in a moment. So the conclusion that I've arrived at is that if I wanna be filming handheld, it's probably best if I stay stationary, maybe doing that slight hips back and forth thing to get the little camera pan and parallax, um, especially if I zoom in more, if I try to do any moving shots, it falls apart 
pretty quickly. You can save some of it with post stabilization, but the big frame stutters are really hard to overcome. And if I was stationary, I found if I got too greedy and was zoomed all the way in and I wasn't being as careful with the camera as I could, there would usually be a moment where some stutters would come into the image. So obviously this is still much better than if we had zero internal stabilization in the camera body, but the full frame sensor in the Sony mirrorless stuff really does struggle to counteract any larger handheld movement or bumps. And so that's something I would consider here for a lot of the more zoomed in range that you're gonna to wanna to be doing, you're probably gonna to wanna to be either filming over cranked in 60 frames, 120 frames per second and slowing down to kind of smooth out your micro jitters. You're gonna be wanting to be doing stabilization passes in post, or you're just gonna be filming from monopods uh, and tripods. And using camera support is a pretty common thing, especially using gimbals and things like that. But I was hoping I could squeeze out more shots on the tighter range that could play in real time and not be as shaky, and I struggled to get that done. So now that I know it's a limitation, I'll just change the way that I use this. I'll either brace more on my body, I'll prioritize filming shots that I want to use in slow motion. And a good example here is that I actually use this lens for the entirety of a helicopter doors off flight. And this lens was amazing for that. And you're thinking, okay, well, handheld filming out of a helicopter, of course you need lens stabilization. But again, by knowing its limitations, by working around that, by shooting in 120 frames per second, by trying to frame shots that I felt pretty confident I could stabilize well later, I was able to work around that and still get incredible coverage. Okay, so I think we've covered a lot of the big things that I was curious about testing with this lens. And now we're left with the big question of where does this fit into my documentary shooting kit going forward? Is it going to replace my trusty 24 to 105 it's a complicated answer, one that also feels a little unfair to try to give a definitive answer for in a video where Tamron sent out the lenses for me to test. I will, however, do my best to explain here my decision-making process when I'm trying to decide which lenses I'm going to pick. To me, these are all tools that we use to go get the job done. And every tool that we use has different compromises or limitations, and knowing those is helpful for then choosing how you're gonna use it or work around those to try to meet your different objectives. So for me, the 24 to 105, what I was losing out on shallow depth of field, I was gaining in a lighter lens that also had extended reach to 105. However, I did often feel when I zoomed into 105, I liked it so much that I wish I could zoom in more. And so then that brings us to the, the common dilemma of do we invest in and pack along a 70 to 200? This is a common problem that people find as they're trying to build out their lens kits and also keep weight in mind. And so let's say we did that, the 70 to 200 millimeter, a classic lens in the action sports world. With that lens on my camera in a documentary setting, I could film a once in a lifetime moment, like someone going over a waterfall in a raft and get an amazing tightly framed shot. And I could be really happy with it. But then immediately after, as everyone's like celebrating and there's all this emotion, I would struggle to get wide enough to capture those moments as well. And this is the documentary problem where you need to get your coverage all in moments that you don't have time to switch your lenses. So I've really struggled with the investment into a 70 to 200 because using that lens in the field, I always struggle with the desire to go wide. And I'm not alone in that struggle. My friend Josh, who films hockey professionally, he also uses the 70 to 200 a bunch. And when filming hockey, he can get those nice tight shots. But if the players come to the boards, he can't get wide enough to capture it. So that's where in the world of documentary event shooting, this lens is incredibly practical. The fact that you can go tight and get your wides in one package and do and do it really well. So if I was going to try to boil all of this down to the single biggest compromise I feel I'm making when putting this lens on the camera, it's not the weight, that's manageable. We can work around that, especially because it means you don't need to take some other lenses in your kit. For me, that single compromise is the width the width of the frame, the difference between 24 and 35 millimeter. I so wish this didn't end up being the case, but you can feel the difference when you're on that wide end. You're, you're lacking that ability to get that extra little width. And that's, oh, that's, that's so close to being, it's a tough one, right? Because that means the type of coverage that I'm gonna end up getting when this lens is on my body will feel a little bit different. And it means that if I'm gonna be using this setup, I will probably need to lens change more often to an ultra wide that can get those wider perspectives. Because this lens is, it's so close to being there, but it's, it's not, especially when you use active stabilization, it crops in just that extra little bit more. So that's where I almost wish as if we could have, let's say a 20 millimeter to, to 135. If we could have a lens with that focal range, that that would be kind of the dream lens for me, especially if it was stabilized and 
f2.8. That kind of coverage would be pretty amazing as a lens option. But right now, with this available as a tool that I can pick knowing its limitations, I'm quite pleased with. Especially more in the corporate documentary event world that I do for work, this lens basically just lives on the camera. So much so that I'm actually buying two more copies of this lens for a job I have coming up because it's just so practical to put on these cameras and just leave it on it all day and get tons of incredible coverage. Okay, let's transition our discussion over into wide angles. And there's actually some features that Tamron has implemented in the 35 to 150 in the 20 to 40 millimeter. And this is stuff that I feel like every lens manufacturer should be doing. So they've got a USB-C port on here and you can use it with their desktop software to customize some of the features about the lens. And this is really helpful. So specifically around filmmaking, you can change what some of these buttons do on the lens itself, but more importantly, you can change the linear throw of the actual focus ring itself. So this is my biggest pet peeve with fly-by wire lenses where you're not actually physically moving the lens elements with the focus ring, it's done electronically. I've been asking like, why can't we customize the way that the focus ring interacts with the way that the focus changes? So if you set your focus on something, you change it and you go back to it, why, why can't we customize that so it's linear so that way it stays the same? Thankfully, with the desktop software, you can actually do that with Tamron. So I'm really glad that they're implementing this into their newer lenses. It's also present on the 20 to 40 millimeter. And I think everyone should be taking notes uh, because this is just a better way to do modern lenses. So I appreciate the direction that Tamron is taking their newer series of lenses too. And if you want to, you can check out a link down in the description below to just learn more about Tamron lenses. Tamron, thank you for sponsoring this video and sending out some lenses for me to try. I also, the 150 to 500. This is a lens that I was also testing in Hawaii. And this is a lot of fun up on the mountain getting some really uh, tight in shots and some really cool perspectives that you can grab with a super telephoto. Obviously more of a specialty lens. I would like to now spend the next portion talking about the wide angles. Uh, the 70 to 28 is a well-loved lens. And that in fact was the lens that I wish that I had bought over the 16 to 35. And so the mistake I had made that I was trying to address in the last video was I regretted the 16 to 35 F4 stabilized. Uh, the stabilization wasn't as helpful as I thought it would be. I liked the lighter weight, but that lens just wasn't as, it had too much corner wobble. I didn't end up liking that lens. I hardly ever used it. So the wide angle that I would use most is a 20 millimeter prime. And of course I love prime lenses. The challenge again is to build out a whole lens coverage system based around primes becomes really unpractical with adventure filming. So I bought this last summer and I've basically been using it on every single YouTube video. I really like this until, until <laughs> they released the 20 to 40 this lens is awesome. Uh, I need to be careful here because I might just go too hard on how much I've been enjoying this lens. This fits really nicely into the way that I shoot solo shot adventure videos. And it's one of the highest compliments that I ever get when people go under the solo videos and go, yeah, he's not alone out there. He's got a crew following him filming. That is like the highest compliment I can receive on that because it is a lot of work to set up all these tripod shots, walk past the camera and then do it again and get all these different angles. And this is a lens that I can now use for 90% of those shots. And what I've always struggled with is that when you get to those transition moments or you're at camp and you're building something and you want those detail shots where you want to get tighter in, usually the wide angle that I was using all day isn't capable of getting those shots. But this lens, this lens can do that because you can go to 40. And then if you're using a camera like the a7 IV, which I've been using a bunch lately, you can go to the Super 35 mode and get even tighter in. So the amount of different use cases that you can squeeze out of one lens, being able to go as wide as 20 millimeters, being able to active stabilize down to like a 24 millimeter feel, being able to go to the crop mode, and then just, it's, are you getting a sense for how practical this range can be? I think this range of 20 to 40 millimeters should continue to be a lot more popular than it is yet. I think it's just sort of catching on where people are realizing how powerful it is, how many boxes you can check with a lens like this. And then let's just talk about the weight. So because it is so small, 
I can essentially put this on my camera body. I can be holding my lightweight tripod. I can be walking around doing my activity and just holding onto the tripod with the camera and just, and just holding it. And it's not a burden. I feel like I can just hold it in my arm. And definitely there's lens combinations, the 35 to 150 being one of them. If I had that lens on the camera, on the tripod, walking around with it, as you're kind of just walking and hiking around, it gets to that fatigue ratio where suddenly you're, you're just realizing it's not worth it to keep holding onto this. I need to put it in my bag. I need different ways of carrying it. But there's something about the sweet spot with the small mirrorless systems, this small lens, a carbon tripod, as you're out walking around, I could just keep it in my hand all day. When now would I pick the 17 to 28 millimeter over this lens? Well, if you do want to get to that wider end, if you're more of a vlogger, this is probably your choice if you're doing the walk and talk style thing, because that three millimeters difference does make a difference if you're doing the walk and talk. I was able to make it work with the 20 millimeter, but it doesn't get to that super, super wide feel that you might be looking for. And I think the 17 to 28 might do that a little bit more. But other than that scenario, this has been my new lens of choice. So as a reminder, I've been putting together a lens guide. It's quite extensive and it's been taking me a while. So if you're wanting to see some pros and cons, quick little comparisons of the lens choices that I put together for adventure filmmaking, I'm putting that together and will hopefully be sending it out soon, completely free. The link's in the description to find that, the lens guide. Um, that's going to be it for this one. Thanks for watching and remember, life's better when you make stuff. Peace.